All right, hello everyone and welcome to the noon hour of the UNC Chapel Hill Virtual Science Expo. My name is Jonathan Frederick and I'm incredibly excited to be here. And in fact, I'm in a room on campus at Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center, where we have a mission to serve the state of North Carolina and celebrate everything about science. Well, the other thing I'm excited about is I'm in a room of a few people really well spaced out. We have windows open and we're masked and we're all fully vaccinated. What an incredible year for science. And one thing I'm super excited about as I remove my mask and I'll put it on after the program is that we have three researchers that celebrate one of the most, to me, important messages about science is that it's cooperative, it's social, it's global, and it's so interdisciplinary. There are so many incredible research projects happening that we're just learning about and that are adapting to this whole new world we're in. Today, we're going to talk about the Barcode Galapagos with the Galapagos Science Center. And with us today are Drs. Corbin Jones, Jaime Chavez, and Deanna Pazmino. We are so excited to have them, and they're going to tell us a little bit about what they do. So now I'll turn it over to Corbin. Before that, though, I do want to say one quick thing. Hello to ASEC Early College, one of our featured classrooms for the day. They'll be able to ask questions via the Q&A feature on the Zoom webinar. Everyone else on YouTube, if you have a question, feel free to email us at ncscifest at unc.edu, ncscifest at unc.edu. But for now, please welcome Corbin, Jaime, and Diana. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Jonathan, and uh, welcome to our discussion about the Galapagos Barcode Project and the Galapagos Science Center, which is a joint uh, Universidad de San Francisco de Quito and uh, University of North Carolina institution in the Galapagos Islands. And so we're gonna tell you a little bit about the project as we go through it, why the Galapagos are so special and the GSC. And so to start things absolutely in the opposite way that I was thinking, I'm gonna show some slides and uh, we can uh, talk first about the GSC and then Diana will talk a little bit more about the islands and then Jaime will give us barcode Galapagos. So, so here's where we start. Okay, you know who we are and you can see we're each uh, affiliated with different institutions. Jaime is also at the University of uh, uh, Cal State San Francisco as well. Correct, Jaime? <laughs> okay, so first, I can make this move. I told you this. One of the things that we find so amazing about the Galapagos Islands is the living organisms there. And the Galapagos Islands are located right near the equator, just off the coast of Ecuador. Ecuador is this beautiful little country nestled here between the coast and into the Andes. The Galapagos Islands are right here. And the GSC, which is the Galapagos Science Center, which is this joint uh, research institution that we showed you the video of at the very beginning, is right here on San Cristobal. All right, lovely location. There's the equator and you can see if you wanna visit here, you can actually go just below it. All right. So the Science Center itself is part of a campus of uh, USFQ. USFQ does teaching and classes here. And then behind it in this marvelous building is the Science Center. And the Science Center supports a broad range of uh, research programs and is designed to handle everything from molecular biology, the study of molecules and DNA, to patterns of terrestrial and aquatic uh, ecology, and has many resources to support that. Here's just another view of the Science Center. It's got a lovely conference room right here. that has got a beautiful view out over the ocean. But really, the real work happens in the back. Behind this wall are a bunch of laboratories which allow it to really investigate those fundamental and important scientific questions and social questions that are endemic and native to the Galapagos Islands. But Diana will tell you a little bit about that more in a minute. I wanna share with you what sort of the vision of the Galapagos Science Center is. Uh, they really wanna help us understand island ecosystems. For those of us living here in North Carolina, the Outer Banks are all islands. You know, we've got tons, hundreds, thousands of little tiny islands in this state. And all of them have these unique ecosystems and are constantly under challenge from a combination of ecological, climatological, and social threats. How do we maintain habitat for sea turtles while also providing habitat for humans? 
How do we foster economic well-being in our, in our coastal counties while preserving what makes those coastal counties so unique? These are questions here in North Carolina that we see exactly manifest in the Galapagos. So uh, there's an incredible amount of parallel between the two. Obviously, we're very important in fostering health and well-being of people, animals, and ecosystems. To, to understand the interactions between people and the environment better. Again, this is something that we as North Carolinians have to face every day. It is something that the Galapagans face every single day. And so by working together to do this work at the Galapagos Science Center, we can really make some incredible progress. And then finally, the other last grand challenge for the Galapagos Science Initiative is to promote stewardship. Stewardship is to take care of the world that we have to extend our understanding of how this world is changing, how our actions and those of, of, of nature affect living things and the people that live there. And this involves understanding the dynamics of both local places, maybe it's the Galapagos Islands, but as well as the entire Pacific and all the other islands in the Pacific. And so we wanna do this and understand it to benefit both the Galapagos Islands themselves, North Carolina, and of course, the world. So, as scientists, we're nerds, right? We're, we're happy nerds. And we have all our own little areas of research expertise that we know something about. Maybe it's iconic and invasive species over here in blue or evolutionary biology, part of my background. Maybe it's someone studying data science. How do you calculate and estimate these things based off the huge amounts of data being gathered by satellites or ocean monitors? Maybe it's about tourism and globalization, that critical economic data. How do you bring this all together? Well, that's one of the strengths of the Galapagos Science Center is that we have from the beginning targeted to bring together the social aspects of science, the terrestrial, that's the land-based aspects, and the marine. And all of these overlap in many areas, which we're gonna talk about as part of the Barco Galapagos project, but also, into the fundamental threats to island sustainability, which if you think about it, islands are really kind of microcosms for our own stability. Of course, the Galapagos Science Center isn't just about doing new and novel research across all these diverse areas. It's also about teaching. And one of the things we're very happy to do is host students from the University of North Carolina down there at the Galapagos Center to participate in research, to get to know life in the Galapagos Islands and to really understand what the broader world is about. So here's just a picture of a class of students from one summer program a little while ago. So with that, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Diana and she's gonna tell you a little bit about what makes the Galapagos so special. And she's gonna do this with her own slides. So as soon as she's ready, she can tell me to stop sharing. Thank you, Corbin. Yep, I can start sharing mine now. There we go. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I'm very, very excited to be here with you and to share a little bit about the Galapagos Islands, which is actually my um, homeland. So, well, Corbin gave us already a bit of information. These volcanic islands are located about a thousand kilometers from the Ecuadorian mainland. And one of the things that make them so special and so biodiverse is that they are located in a place where we have three major oceanic currents intersecting. And as a result, we have highly differentiated environments in such a small geographic scale. And this allows for a number of species that are very different one from another to live in the same area. So overall, the Galapagos are um, the home of over um, 10,000 species. Uh, this is counting plants, this is counting animal vertebrates, invertebrates. So that's a huge number of species for a small geographic scale, right? And then from these 10,000 species, over 2,000 are endemic, which means uh, they, are not, uh, they cannot be found anywhere else in the world. We have a reptile that dives, the marine iguana. We have a flightless cormoran. Uh, we have a penguin in the tropics, the only penguin species that uh, can be found in, in the northern hemisphere. Um, so it's a very special place. 
uh, the isolation, so being thousand kilometers from, uh, far from mainland, has allowed these species to evolve and to adapt to specific environments. And we all know this is also the place where Darwin came and studied land birds, mockingbirds, and um, and finches, and came up with a theory of evolution, right? Uh, but it's not only animals or plants, and um, it's also uh, the variety of ecosystems and landscapes that we find here. So we have areas that are humid, we have areas that are very, very arid, uh, and we have places like this one that I'm showing you here, which is uh, the sulfur mine in Isabela, which is actually in one of the active volcanoes in the west, in one of the westernmost islands in Isabela, and in one of my favorite places as well. So imagine not only the big animals and plants, but all the um, microbiome, uh, the, the bacteria, the, the things that we cannot see, but the things that are still here in these areas, most of which are unexplored yet. But the Galapagos is not only uh, the natural part, Corbin was mentioning, we have a population here. We actually have four populated islands. San Cristobal, where the Galapagos Science Center is, Santa Cruz, Floriana, and Isabela, where I am from. So we have a population that depends on the resources and the activities that derive from these resources, such as tourism. But we also, uh, this also means we, as a population base here, are impacting somehow the islands and, and the natural environment here. And this is something that we're just starting to understand. And the projects we develop here are aimed to help us understand this better so we can preserve the, these, these beautiful islands. And for me personally, it all started here. This is a picture of Isabela of uh, Tintorera's Isle, which is just in front of. Um, uh, the town in Isabela. Uh, this is a picture taken from a childhood friend. And when we were little kids, uh, our dads, our parents used to take us here to swim. I don't know if you have noticed yet, but there's plenty of white reef sharks here in this channel that is no more than two meters wide. So we used to come here and swim with the sharks. Um, and of course, we are little kids. The sharks are probably bigger than us and we're super scared. But at the same time, we're so excited and we started asking tons of questions about these animals and started to fall in love with all the, the marine life in general. So this means not only asking questions about uh, why the sharks are here, how does a shark, uh, you know, swim or breathe or everything, but also started noticing that we are creating an impact on these animals, that the more boats that are allowed in the islands, the less we're starting to see animals. So asking questions about what are the threats that we're putting on this. And this shaped completely my life. I became a marine biologist and I uh, am now using genetic tools to understand uh, populations of sharks and rays in the Galapagos and in general in the region in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. So using genetics to see how are they connected, if we're talking about a single nursery space or multiple nurseries, uh, if one population is more, more vulnerable than the other, and all this in, or, uh, in order to support conservation and management of these beautiful animals. And we use also other um, techniques. We use drones to survey these nursery areas. And the most we um, study these places, uh, we're starting to notice that there's so many things we don't know yet. So it, that, that is pretty, pretty exciting. And at the moment, uh, all the science that I'm doing um, has taken me to be part of the barcode project. And Jaime is going to provide a bit more details about the barcode project. And maybe a bit later on, I can tell you how am I involved and what my role is in the barcode project. So I'm passing it over to you, Jaime. Actually, can I grab it first, just so we can walk through the technology side before Jaime yes. shows his slides? All right, will you please stop sharing? Thank you. So as I mentioned, the uh, Galapagos Science Center has these fully heavily equipped laboratories. And in order to make this barcode project work, which Jaime is gonna really tell you about, Diana started giving you the hints about it already, we had to take advantage of all of these resources, but we're also taking advantage of some really cool cutting edge technology. One of which is called uh, nanopore sequencing. 
So I'm going to show you a video in a minute that explains how nanopore sequencing works. Here's literally one of the nanopores that I went and took a picture of my hand. That's my hand uh, uh, in the lab yesterday. You see they're very small. They're smaller than your cell phone. We now have the ability to take sequencing on the road, on the boat, anywhere potentially in these islands. So let me explain a little bit how nanopore sequencing works. It's going to allow us to get DNA information, information about genes in a remarkably novel way. So please watch this video. Oxford Nanopore Technologies has developed nanopore-based DNA and RNA sequencing technology designed to provide on-demand biological information to any person in any environment. Protein nanopores are tiny holes that in nature form gateways across membranes. In our technology, protein nanopores are embedded into a synthetic membrane bathed in an electrophysiological solution and an ionic current is passed through the nanopores. As molecules such as DNA or RNA move through the nanopores, they cause disruption in the current. This signal can be analyzed in real time to determine the sequence of bases in the strands of DNA or RNA passing through the pore. During sequencing, the nanopore analyzes the entire fragment of DNA or RNA that's presented to it, so the read length is directly related to the length of the DNA or RNA in the sample that has been prepared. Users can influence their read lengths by choosing the right preparation methods for their desired experimental results. Standard extraction methods readily achieve reads from the tens to hundreds of kilobases, and gentle extraction methods devised by community users have achieved read length in excess of two megabases. Long reads provide a more unambiguous approach to mapping a DNA or RNA sequence, enabling much simpler assembly. Using nanopore technology, you can sequence DNA and RNA directly, rather than through a copy or synthetic strand, without the need for a surrogate marker. This means modification information remains intact and is included in the signal information provided to the user during the run. As PCR isn't necessary for nanopore sequencing, amplification bias is removed and library preparation workflows are simpler. All Oxford nanopore sequencing devices use the same core technology, making it simple to pilot experiments and scale depending on the application. From the handheld Flongol and Minine to the benchtop Gridine and Promethine, devices are available to perform on-demand sequencing experiments from single tests to ultra-high throughput projects. All offer rapid, long-read, real-time, direct sequencing of DNA or RNA. Preparing DNA or RNA for nanopore sequencing is a straightforward process, taking as little as 5 to 10 minutes to add the sequencing adapter and motor protein to the end of molecules in your sample. We also provide devices for automated library prep to make what is already a straightforward process hands-off and programmable. Our devices start to stream data as soon as the experiment begins, translating the changes in signal into the sequence of bases locally on your computer or onboard devices from Oxford Nanopore. This real-time analysis means you get an insight into what you're sequencing and the quality of your experiment immediately, rather than having to wait until a fixed run is finished. Users can also take advantage of epitome workflows for real-time analysis, ranging from rapid species identification to human genome alignment. There is also the option to use your own workflows or those from the Nanopore community. Get your starter pack today at nanoporetech.com. All right, I hope that helped give you an idea how the technology works. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Jaime to actually take you through how we're gonna use this technology, the resources in the Galapagos to understand the, or to apply the genetic barcode project. Jaime, it's all you, sir. Thank you so much, Tobin, and I'm super happy to be here. Um, as you probably saw in those beautiful pictures that Diana showed, um, you, may, you, you may want to go to the Galapagos right now, but you're not the only one. 
there are 800 visitors that used to get to these islands a day to enjoy you know, the scenery and to learn more about nature. It is one of the top world destinations in our planet. And as we all know, also know, there are at least 30,000 people that live on these islands and they're all heavily rely on the economics of tourism. But the only thing that we all know is that after the pandemic hit, the transport and the travel was in, uh, ban was in place. And that means empty streets. You can see on this photo here, Galapagos was empty out of those thousands of tourists that will come every day. And with that, something dramatic happens. It reveals how fragile it is a, an economy that is based on tourism and also on the funds and money that can come to be used for preserving environments, conservation management programs, and even research. And within the local Galapagos populations, the groups that are more hit or they were more hit are those guides that you can see here in front of those tourists. The fishermen that are providing food for the locals and for this big number of tourists that come in and farmers as well. So we have now a very critical situation where people are hurting, people are out of job and that put in peril some of the um, environmental managements on the islands. So this project um, as you can see here at the bottom, is a collaboration between institutions across continents. So we have the University of San Francisco de Quito in Ecuador, the University of Exeter in the UK, and funds coming from many different institutions like UKRI, the Newton Fund, and we have our local institutions like the Galapagos Science Center in San Cristobal, and the uh, ABG, which is the agency who uh, controls invasive species coming to the islands to protect them from uh, the negative effects of species coming in that are not welcome. So one of the things that uh, we want to do with this project is try to um, mitigate the direct economic or pressure that human populations have right now during the pandemic. And as I mentioned earlier, when people are desperate, bad things can happen. You know, we can do crazy stuff and they can have a very negative impact in our environment. There were people thinking that, oh, you know, now we need to find very quickly way to make money. So they were thinking about opening up to new or restricted uh, fishing practices that are banned in other places and it's banned on the Galapagos, but desperately people wanted to go back to those. They said, we need tourists, let's open up airports. It doesn't matter if a plane comes from Miami, from Hawaii, we need tourists. Well, there is a huge strict protocol to avoid importing invasive species in our airports in the mainland They used to mitigate that. So by opening that, we could have allowed all these invasive species to come to the Galapagos. Um, and also, you know, some of these illegal activities like um, trafficking of native species could have also increased. These little tortoises go for $7,000 in the market in Europe. So what we want to do is how can we help both people in the Galapagos and the Galapagos itself with a scientific project? So we propose to tackle some of these um, issues, trying to release the economical and increase scientific value in benefit of the islands. And that's how our project Galapagos Genetic Barcode was born. And Corbin already mentioned something that is very important is that we're trying to implement new technology in this huge scientific project. So one of the interesting things about the barcode and I want to explain what barcode means is that every single species can be identified by its DNA. So usually one species possess one unique genetic barcode. The same way that you go in the supermarket and you scan an apple, the computer knows that that's an apple based on the barcode. The same thing you can do with DNA. And the way to do this, usually, it can take days and weeks sometimes to send the samples to a laboratory. But now we have this very cool uh, technology, the mini ion you can see here in the computer with the little device. And we can have a very quick and rapid identification of species from samples from which we don't even know what they are. So there's a direct benefit in the um, scientific world to tackle very important questions. And in particular in the Galapagos, we can have a very quick identification of species that can we use for illegal traffic of a species. So sadly, sometimes we have examples like this one on the right that illegal fishermen 
uh, will collect you know, sharks and fish. And sometimes it takes weeks to, to be identified. Now with this technology, we can know immediately what species are being harvested and we can implement law and, and regulations quickly instead of waiting months to years to identify these species. The other sadly thing that happens is, you know, I mentioned these little tortoises, 150 tortoises less than a month ago, trying to be smoked out of the Galapagos. Well, we want to put them back in nature. We don't know what species there are. There's more than 15 species of Galapagos giant tortoises and every island has one. So we can't wait 30 years for these uh, uh, little tortoises to grow so we can know where they are. But if we use genetic barcode, in a few hours, we know exactly where they're from and we can send them back to those islands. It could also help scientists to discover new species. And I'll just put it here an example of reef fishes. There might be new species that need to be identified that is hard to identify just by looking at it. Genetically, we can do that. And the other thing uh, that is important is this invasion of the new species that are coming and um, changing the ecosystems on the Galapagos. Some of them come as a larvae and we cannot again wait until they develop to know what species are. And also you have to be a specialist sometimes of these um, to identify these species. Now you don't need to be an expert. You, as long as you know how to use this technique, you can be on the beach taking, you know, sipping so caipirinha. And at the same time, you can be identifying if these species are coming in and might possess a threat to the islands. So this is the core of our scientific project. And who is this project? aim to. So we want to impact and have large benefit to the community. We are currently training and employing 76 locals, including, as I mentioned, most of them naturalist guides, who already possess a lot of information about the biology of the islands, as well as fishermen and farmers. And in, the idea here is they can use these techniques to help monitor and identify Galapagos biodiversity and also try to help the, the project of invasive species control. This is the largest citizen project to the islands up to, until this day. There hasn't been a project that is this big that has put science into the hands of the citizens on, on the Galapagos. And what we try to do as well is maybe to create new employment possibilities for these locals populations in the future. We provide new skills. You can see here they've been trained with top, you know, in top of the art scientists uh, labs in the Galapagos Science Center. They're learning lab techniques. They're learning how genetics work. So we making this transfer of technology and who knows, they might become the, the next scientists of tomorrow. It might be a new job opportunity for them to start becoming scientists and make a job out of this. Given the fragility of the tourist industry, maybe this is a good option to and a good moment to, um, to jump into a new line for research. And the other thing that we want to do is that implement these techniques, those barcodes or mini ions are going to stay in the islands. So now every island is going to be equipped with these super nice equipment to be able to sequence DNA in a few hours instead of sending those out to the mainland and sometimes to, to uh, foreign countries for this work to be done. Now, all the work can be done by locals in Galapagos 100% for conservation of the Galapagos. And that is where we're so excited that this project um, is taking on and um, we'll be having some results hopefully pretty soon. Very cool. What an exciting project. What an incredible project. I have a quick um, question. Uh, so let's say I'm, I'm one of the trained folks and I'm out in the field and I see a species that I don't recognize and I have the equipment and I know what to do. Take us through the steps. Like, do I do the DNA sampling right there? Do I grab something and collect it and put it in a bag and carry it to the lab? What happens? Diana, you want to tell us a little bit the, the protocol? Yes, sure. Well, I, I wish it was that um, easy and that simple, uh, but everything here uh, in the Galapagos, it's regulated. You know, it's such a delicate um, environment that everything needs to be properly done and regulated. And we have authorities like the Galapagos National Park at the local level and authorities like the Ministry of Environment at the national level uh, who grant permits for research. So. Everything we do, it's under a research permit that has been previously um, approved. So what we do needs to be planned. Yes, we are trying to respond to many questions like trying to uncover new species. 
ideas that we don't know or that cannot be morphologically defined. And we're trying to just assess diversity and compare diversity in different bioregions within the Galapagos. We're going to do a lot of these things, but it, it all requires also a bit of planification, of planning, sorry, and um, to make sure we have the permits to do so. Uh, we don't want people actually just coming and grabbing whatever they see on, on their waste because that, that could be um, harmful for, for these species and for the environment as well. Got you. Thank you for that answer. Remember, if you are on the call, you're able to, if you're one of the folks from the agriculture and technical college or early college, you're able to answer your questions into the Q&A feature on Zoom. Um, everyone else, you can email questions if you're on the YouTube feed by ncscifest at unc.edu and our tech team will drop it into the chat. Um, there seems to be this tension. One of the questions we have here is between um, sort of wanting slash needing tourism but then also the pressures it creates. And it almost sounds like you're trying to thread that needle of, of, of walking that fine line of balance. Um, what have you learned along the way as you've rolled out, started to roll out this project? And I know that's kind of a broad uh, question. Feel free to take it in whatever direction you'd like. Um, I mean, I can I can mention something, and and I think I mentioned early. It just first of all shows how how fragile um, an, an economy that is based on tourism can be. And the issue here is that well, today unfortunately, on the last year, it was the pandemic, but tomorrow we don't know what could also you know uh, be changing uh, mobility of people. Tomorrow it could be climate change. It could be um, something uh, that is unexpected. And to have an entire society that relies on one source of income is very dangerous. As in many things that we've learned in nature, you need to have you know, multiple ways out to survive. And I th we think that by implementing these type of alternatives are gonna allow the community to um, be more resilient and to maybe implement different ways on how we need to do and see tourism in the future. Maybe there are different ways that we can do um, tourism in, in place like the Galapagos, in which um, we become less, you know, more sheltered to these uh, unpredictabilities in, in the future. So um, I th we think the science has a, a big step and a big role in changing that perception. And I think the Galapagos is a perfect place to start doing that. I could add to that. Deanna, why don't you go first? And then I'll add one further note. Thanks. Thanks, Corbin. Yeah, if, I'm, if I can add on that, uh, in conservation in general, it's so important to have uh, the local community involved, like to feel part of what um, you're doing as a scientist and to be committed with what the objective is, which is preserving the islands. And for so, for so long, we have had this um, disconnected. So having these 76 local people on board with this project, it's also helping us make this connection. So it's, uh, it's for us an opportunity to show them why is that we're doing what we're doing as a scientist and what can they do to support and to help us achieve these goals. And uh, they are responding very, very well to that. Like they're so curious, they have so many ideas, they have so many great uh, suggestions for us to improve or to do and other things. You know, sometimes the local people are the ones who know the place even better than the scientists. They have been working day after day, going to the sea or going to, uh, to the highlands and, and doing their jobs. So it's also a source of knowledge that we as a scientist most of the time lack. So to just follow up and again, bring it to the North Carolina aspect. Again, we face here in North Carolina, many of the same challenges out of the sounds and the outer banks. And I think as, as, as we learn from the Galapagos, how they thread that precious needle of balancing, preserving what makes a place so unique and sharing it with the world. This project, as they learn to thread that needle, we all can learn to thread that needle a bit better here. 
That's a nice parallel. Thank you all for your input. We do have a question. And I said agriculture and technical early college. My mistake. So sorry. It's agriculture and science early college. We have a question from those folks. They want to know how many species have you found this way or how many do you think you'll find this way? Um, so there, I want, I want to make sure, you know, that um, barcode has been used already in the Galapagos by other scientists to try to identify species that are very hard to identify just by looking at them. And we're talking about beetles. Um, so what we're trying to do here is uh, we are starting to uh, get this, this, some of these analysis uh, in place right now. We haven't gotten to the point in which we can identify a new species or not. But one of the exciting things that we're doing, and I, I know Diana is going to explain a bit more about that, is that we can start identifying species um, without even going and going after those species by collecting some samples in the environment or by collecting a little um, spoonful of soil from different parts of the island. We can start identifying thousands of new microbes fungi or mini vertebrates that live on these islands that are hard to, to even see them on the naked eye. So by this technique, we can start disentangling and discovering so many species. So we are looking forward to um, have these results coming up in the next few months. So I will um, keep you posted on that. But um, yeah, maybe it's a good time to, to talk a little bit about what this environmental DNA project um, is and what is what would be the the results from from this uh, project that Diana is taking on? Yeah, maybe this is a good time for me to show you the last few slides uh, I got and to tell you maybe this will reply to our next question as well. Um, give me just one second. Yes. All right. So um, how? Um, what is exactly that we're doing here in terms of uh, local capacity building and training these people? In some cases, like the Isabella Island, uh, which is one of the most isolated, we are building a lab from zero. And we do not need, in this case, you know, a, a, a three story or five story building. We need a space that is clean enough and where we can have our equipment. You saw it's, it's smaller than your cell phone. So we don't need much space, but we need um, some organized space. And we are training people, people, local people, it's supporting us to, to put this together and we're training them on how to do the molecular part. So extracting the DNA, um, we're going to train them on how to sequence, we're training them on how to look into genetic databases and how to use actually these barcodes to identify a species or, or to do other stuff. In other cases, like um, in San Cristobal or in San we have some infrastructure, um, local collaborator, which is the ABG or the Agency of Bioregulation and Control. So for some of these people, it's the, verse, the very first time that they are in contact with a scientific collection. So starting from, from, um, from like, things as simple as that. In some other cases, they have a bit of experience with that, but zero experience with the lab or zero experience with field collections. So we're training them a little bit on everything to all of them. Um, and in some cases we need to adapt. Of course, we don't have a space, but uh, we have a table and it's just like this. I love this picture because uh, we are teaching a fisherman and a farmer how to collect an eDNA sample and how to filter this eDNA sample. And uh, what's eDNA? It's environmental DNA, what Jaime was just saying. You go to a place, you grab a liter of water or a piece of, um, of soil or, or sediment, and then you take that to the lab. And in the lab, you um, try to find what DNA is in this sample. And it can be a turtle, a turtle, it could be a whale, it could be a shark, it could be a ray. You didn't even have to go and sample this animal or to even see this animal. You can know that it was there just by grabbing a liter of water in a specific area. So this, for these people, this is the very first time that they're using this equipment and they're learning about biosecurity, they're learning about cross-contamination, they're learning about uh, everything in order to obtain a big amount of data that will tell us a lot about biodiversity in the Galapagos. 
this is another session of um, training in San Cristobal. In San Cristobal, uh, we are extremely lucky and spoiled, I would say, because we have the Galapagos Science Center. So this infrastructure that Corbin was showing in his photos, we have like high tech labs and spaces that we can use. Uh, and, and even we have areas where we can store these samples in the long term. We have a biobank in the Galapagos Science Center. So a space, a freezer uh, that we can put the samples at minus 80 degrees. And this will allow us, uh, us or somebody else to come later and make a good use of this sample again. Because each sample we take, it's a lot of uh, resources, time, money, having people um, trained to go and collect the samples. So they're very, very valuable for us. This is the inside of one of the labs in the Galapagos Science Center. And, and people here is learning how to do eDNA extraction. And, and I saw a question about how do you um, engage these people? Yes, after they, they have done their first DNA extraction, the first thing they, some of them told us is, well, you know, I never thought I will be capable of doing this. I always thought this would be a highly trained person, a person that has gone to university and done this for years, but I, I did it in three days time. Like I learned and I can do it and I'm pretty confident I can keep helping anyone who, who has this type uh, of opportunities. So it's, it's really, really amazing. It's incredible. Thank you. I love this project. It, it kind of represents everything we like to celebrate about science, particularly that it's like leading edge science, which is a little bit of a cliche, but also authentic and working with the people who live and are from there. So um, absolutely incredible. I do want to give a little bit of time in case anyone else wants to say a few things. We are up against time. We've taken some good questions. Um, I do want to thank ASEC, the students on the call. Thank you so much for being here. We know this has been a wild year for you. And I'll let uh, Corbin or Jaime or Diana say a few more words, and then I'll wrap up. Well, I, I think I would like to have, say a big thanks to Deanna for calling in from the islands. And, and it is no small feat to be able to maintain an internet connection from the middle of the Pacific. And, and Jaime for the inspiration to really make this project happen. I mean, we've been wanting to do so much in the DNA space in the Galapagos and his and the rest of the team's creativity in driving this and Diana's creativity in building this up has been absolutely critical. And the Galapagos Science Center is just privileged to be part of this larger project. With that, I'll let Diana and Jaime have the last words. Well, I just wanna say that um, this is a project that could never would have been able to be put in place without all the collaboration. Um, this is an, a team effort and this is an international effort and it's a local effort. I mean, the fact that people in Galapagos, you know, are out of job and want to take the risk to jump on this is huge. So we, you know, we are in depth about the curiosity, the willingness of the locals to try to come out um, on the winning side of these, this very critical time. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, you can see the logos in the bottom and there's so many people that are behind the scenes doing the, doing critical work that, uh, you know, we are just the, the face of today, but there, so again, you know, we, we are a huge team and, and this is something that, you know, one of the messages that if you want to get far, you, you all need to get, you know, good friends and good people with you. Uh, and this is an example for, of that. The best message we could close on all the time. Outstanding. Thank you, Jaime, Diana, and Corbin. Um, really appreciate it. Corbin, you look like you want to say one more thing. I, I think I want Diana to have the last word. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I jumped in. I was too eager. Sorry, Diana. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, well, I uh, just um, uh, agree with Jaime that this is a team effort. Uh, it's a massive team behind scenes um, that you don't see every day. And having the support of the GSC and these big institutions as Exeter, USFQ, and UNC, it, it's, uh, it's really a privilege. And um, one thing maybe I, at the beginning of this project, I, just as, as when I was a little kid, I was so scared, but the more you interact with these people, the more you learn from other researchers as well. It's, it's one thing that keeps me motivated and inspires me to keep doing this every day. And I hope you find uh, some inspiration on this as well. Thank you all for, um, for, for your questions. They were great as well. 
Absolutely outstanding. Thank you, Deanna. And thank you to the Galapagos Science Center. It's one of those examples where UNC Chapel Hill works collabor collaboratively around the globe with researchers like these folks. And what an incredible project. So thank you to everyone for being a part of this session.